Welcome to the Voice of Victory, streaming live from the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. As we prepare to hear today's message, please find your Bible, a notepad, and a pen or pencil. Now, let's join this morning's worship service already in progress. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into Since Jesus came into 
As you are standing, as we give a place of honor to the reading of God's Word, find Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. There are Bibles there in the chairs in front of you, or you will see this reading on the screen in front of you this morning. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. We want to welcome those that are worshiping with us this morning over the internet, and uh, we are so grateful for that opportunity that God has provided us, and we welcome you to our worship service this morning. And so now, follow along as I read for us this passage where Jesus teaches us a great lesson about life. Beginning at verse 13, Luke chapter 12, someone from the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, Jesus said to him, Who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Jesus then told them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I do not have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all of my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. May we not lose sight of being rich toward God. Thank you, you may be seated. I have to tell you this morning that I have suspected for a long time that many of the people that drive on the highways with me (laughs) have very little recall as to what those signs and directional uh, road signals mean. I've suspected that for a long time. Well, I have to tell you that while I was in Florida this week visiting with my dad, it was confirmed. (laughs) Uh, Just a quick update. My my dad is not much better, but all of you have been so kind. Thank you for your loving prayers and support and encouragement and allowing me time to go and to spend a little time with him in these closing days. But I'm going to tell you, It is just absolutely crazy out there. And, you know, honestly, when when I had to take the test to get a driver's license, that sign that has a big upside down U on it and it has a mark across it and it says no U-turn on it, I thought that meant no U-turn. Not in Florida. 
not at a major intersection where there are 500 cars trying to get through the intersection. No, you just turn right in front of everybody that's going through the intersection and cross over five lanes of traffic and go to the Walgreens. <laughs> that's, that's what you do. That's, that's what... Or if there's a sign that says right lane, right turn only, that's not what it means. <laughs> if there's a solid white line that says do not cross this solid white line, by the way, that's what that solid white line means. I, I just, at least it did when I took the test. No, if you're a 25 ton dump truck, no, all you have to do is just turn on your left hand blinker, at least he did that, and back traffic up for two blocks while you're in the right turn and turn only because traffic is backed up and they're trying to get across. No, just wait. When the, when the traffic light finally turns green, he's coming over. I've just, it was confirmed for me this week that most of us really have forgotten. We have a failure to recall what all of those road signs and, and assistance that they are given mean to us. And while it's a challenge to navigate on our highways, whether you're in Florida or Tennessee these days, um, and it's becoming more of a challenge in Mount Juliet, have you noticed? Wow. I don't know where all these people are coming from. Florida, that's right. I should have known. And I can identify some of them are definitely from Sarasota, Florida, because I know what that's like down there. Oh, my. But it's just crazy how these things go. And, you know, we think about that, and, and that's a part of our everyday life. It's a part of our daily routine and existence. But the thing that I'm becoming more concerned about is not so much how people fail to follow the traffic laws, although that is concerning. I'm as much concerned about how people who share our faith are disregarding the teachings that Jesus have give, has given us to follow to make our lives more than an empty life. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal and kill, but I have come to give you life that is full and meaningful. But Jesus would also say in John 14, 15, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will follow the directions. You will follow the teachings that I've laid out for you so that you might know and fully realize the abundant life, the life that is meaningful and that is purposeful and that allows you to glorify the name of the Father. That's the life that I want you to live. That's the love that I want you to display toward me. It's one thing for us to gather on Sunday morning and to sing the songs that we sang this morning and routinely here on Sunday mornings. We lift up our voices in praise through songs of praise, giving Him thanks. But what God is really searching for in our lives is to know whether or not we truly love Him. And if we love Him, we will keep His commandments. And in John 15, Jesus would speak to us about being divine and we are the branches. And he said, if we want to display and if we really want to exhibit life and life that is full and meaningful, if we want to bear fruit, we must remain in the vine. We must stay there in the vine. It means that we need to continue to be connected to him. How am I connected to the Lord? I'm connected by knowing and understanding that which he would have me to do, that which he would have me to be, as I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb who died on Calvary's cross for me to restore me to life. 
Because once I was dead in my trespasses and sin, but glory to God, thanks be to God, he has made me alive as a result of the love he had for me, and he has made me alive with Christ. Therefore, my life is in the vine who is Jesus, and I need to remain in him. And how do I remain in him? The only way that people will know that you and I are remaining in him is the result of the fruit that comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives because it is the fruit of the Spirit that everyone sees. And what does that mean? How is that displayed? It's displayed this way. Because we love one another. And we care for one another. And when I'm driving through this life, I'm not doing it only with myself in mind. I'm doing it not only to preserve my life, but to preserve and to protect the lives of everyone that's sharing life's highway with me. How important is that? Jesus tells us that it's very important. In this passage that we've read today, we see a man who was misguided, was only wanting that which he felt was best for him, not sensing the fact that as a believer, as a follower of Christ, as one who is seeking to honor the Lord, to display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, faith and love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, self-control, all those things. And by the way, you, you want to, to have a real experience in expressing the fruit of the Spirit? Drive I-40. You'll get a little of that, right? Or maybe Mount Juliet Road. So you see what I'm saying? That, that sounds, Pastor, that's just so silly. It is, but it isn't. Because here's what we need to understand about this. God longs to bless us. Not so that I am blessed, but so that he is blessed as I bless others in the blessings he's given to me. You see, an empty life is a life that is lived within a circle where I've built a wall around myself and saying, listen, the only reason that I'm living is to gather a few more things inside this wall for me. And that's the example that Jesus gives in this parable. Now, it's very interesting to note the context in which Jesus gives this parable in Luke's gospel and in Luke's account of these events. If you look at the verses that precede it, if you see the things that are going on, actually, if you turn back to ver uh, chapter 11, you'll see that it's in verses 1 and following that Jesus gives the model prayer. He's been asked, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray, how to have a right relationship, how to know what is the right approach to God as I reach out to him, as I seek to relate to him. So Jesus gives us the model prayer. And then they come and they accuse Jesus of being a demon. Jesus says, listen, a house divided cannot stand. He's very clear in that. And then he begins to talk about being blessed, true blessings. And a woman calls out to him in verse 27 of chapter 11, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. Jesus said, no. Rather, blessed is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. Blessed is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. And then he gives the sign. He tells the story of giving the sign of Jonah and about 
how God spared the city and how, if we're not careful with all that God has given us and all the warning that God has given us, if we don't turn our lives back toward Him, if we don't hear His Word and keep it, we're in danger of suffering the judgment of God. And then he talks about going to a a Pharisee's house and he speaks of religious hypocrisy. And you know, in this day in which we live, there's a lot of talk about religious hypocrisy. There's very little done about it. But Jesus denounces it. He's in the home of a Pharisee. He's having a meal with the Pharisee. He doesn't wash his fingertips in the bowl. He doesn't do all of the things that the Pharisees had demanded and and taught that were required before he took a piece of the bread from the table and they criticized him. The, The man that owned the home, the Pharisee, criticized Jesus for that. And Jesus said in verse 42, But woe to you, Pharisees, you give a tenth of mint and rue and every kind of herb, and you pass by judgment and love of God. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. It's interesting how we go through and we find ourselves involved in a casual keeping of the laws, the road laws, the life laws. You know, we give a casual, a cursive keeping of those things just enough so that people say, ah, he looks a little religious. Not quite sure yet, but he, he has the appearance of that. And then Jesus says, you know, you're, you're nothing, you're no different than an unmarked tombstone. People are walking all over it, never knowing something dead is under it. And then Jesus begins to help us to understand how important it is for you and me as followers of Christ not to disregard what Jesus has said to us and how he's called us to recognize the fact it's one thing for us to be in our prayer closet and to beat our chest and to call out to God and to repent of everything. And when we leave there, we've forgotten everything that we've ever said to God. Because we treat everyone else in our lives as if we never walked with Him. And Jesus says to the religious leaders, He's speaking into my life. He's speaking into my life. He's speaking into your life. These words, look at verse 52 of chapter 11. Woe to you experts in the law. You have taken away the key of knowledge. Listen to this. You have taken away the key of knowledge. You didn't go in yourselves and you hindered those who were trying to go in. What is he saying? He's saying when you live like this, when you do not take this seriously, when you do not live according to the calling of God upon your life, when you do not display your love for the Father as you love those that He loves, if you are not careful in keeping the commandments that He's given us, you know, those commandments that He's given us, to love one another, to love God with all of our heart, to love our neighbor as much or more than we love ourselves, For heaven's sakes, you know what? We wouldn't have to have so many police officers out on the highway if we did that. They wouldn't have to be giving us tickets and telling us that, you know, it's good if you turn on your blinker before you turn. That that eight-sided sign that's red and has white letters on it that says S-T-O-P, it really does mean to stop. But how about... The stop sign that God puts in our heart and in our lives when he says, stop being so self-centered. Stop thinking about, stop thinking as if life is only about you. Stop thinking as if it's really a burden to share a little bit of your air with the people around you. Right? And God is wanting to bless us. 
Pastor Rob Zinn says, God is a God who blesses. He desires to profit us, to grow us, and to use us to bear fruit. Clearly, the Bible teaches the importance of obedience to the calling of God. Listen to what he says to us in Isaiah 48, verses 17 and 18. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is good for you and leads you along the paths you should follow. Oh, that you had listened to my commands. Then you would have peace flowing like a gentle river and righteousness rolling over you like the waves of the sea. Obedience. Hearing, listening. You have taken away the keys that open the door. Now listen to me. Do we understand that these were some of the last words that Jesus would speak to us? I have given you the keys to heaven. That which you open will be opened in heaven. What are these keys? How is it that it works? It works when we begin to acknowledge the fact that God has called us to be faithful in our obedience, to acknowledge Him in all things, great or small. Listen to what God said through the prophet Samuel. But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to His voice? Listen, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than writing a check and placing it in the plate. Why is it that we find ourselves sensing this? Because too many of us, quite honestly, too many of us are living like the man in the parable that Jesus told here, the rich fool. He looked out over his crops. He had planted a crop and he looked at what was coming and he at least was a visionary. And he looked out there and he said, I don't have enough room in my barns to store all of the harvest that is coming in just a number of weeks. So at least he was proactive. He tore down all of his barns and he built new ones bigger than ever. And sure enough, when harvest time came, he filled up those barns to the brim. They were all filled. No more room. He finished it. He wiped his hands off, he sat down, and he looked in the mirror and he said, good boy, really good boy, look at what you've done. Look at how you have accomplished something that no one else in the community has done. All the other farmers were coming by and they were seeing those barns and they were clapping as they walked by. And when they got by, they were all grieving because they were jealous of him brokenhearted that they had not had that kind of harvest. It's a little bit like us when we think about our neighbors. Look at that car they drive. Look at how many rooms they have in that house. And we drive by them every Sunday knowing full well that they'll not be here or they'll not be in anyone's church. And we just keep on living like it really doesn't matter. And it does matter. It matters to God. And it should matter to us. And instead of us being jealous over it, And in the back of our mind, though we may never verbalize it, but in the back of our mind, we think, well, they'll get what's coming. I got mine. I got my ticket. I've got what it takes to get 
to heaven. That's where my reward's going to be. We drive by and we just simply say, I hope someone will help them get theirs. Since when have you failed to understand that you are the someone? You see, an empty life, an empty life is when I begin to live thinking that the only thing that really matters is me taking care of me and mine. Listen to how this man speaks in this parable. Listen to what he says in verse 18. I will do this, he says. I will tear down my barns. I will build bigger ones and store all of my grain and my goods there. Then I will say to whom? To myself. You have. Oh, man, look at this. This is life. This is full. This is the American dream. You have many goods stored up for many years. Now, just sit back, sell your John Deere's. You don't need them anymore. (laughs) Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Don't worry about a thing. You see, that's what life does to us. But here's what Jesus said. The young man cried out from the crowd. Jesus has been telling the crowd that had gathered around him what it meant to beware of religious hypocrisy. He's been telling them to fear God and to honor God and to follow God and to love God. He's been telling them to acknowledge Christ and the fact that God has sent him and that the way to the promise of God is through him. He's been telling them that. And in in, in this highlight of all these people that have gathered, the crowd is so large that Jesus is having to find an elevated place where he can be able to speak to them. And then all of a sudden, this, this guy calls out from the crowd and says, Hey, teacher! How about, now, now understand this, Jesus has been touching people, healing them. Jesus has been ministering to people. Jesus has been cleansing them of unclean spirits. Jesus has been doing the work of God. And all of a sudden, this guy cries out from the crowd, and, and this is what he says. Hey, tell my brother to give me what I deserve from the inheritance that daddy left me. <laughs> Jesus said, listen. Listen. You need to be reminded today, in the midst of all that I'm saying to you, that life, life is not measured by how much one might own. I've not been been sent here to settle these issues. I've been here to make you right with the Father in heaven. I've been sent here to come and to show you how to walk on the path of righteousness that leads to the promise of everlasting life. I've been sent here to open your eyes and your ears that you might hear and see the true measure of a man, of a person. It's not in the things you hold in your hand, but rather it's what's in your heart. It's who's in your heart. Do you know Christ? Do you know me? Do you understand why I've come? Do you recognize the fact that the greatest investment or inheritance of all is the investment that I'm going to make in your life in just a few days as I walk down the Via Della Rosa up to the hill called Calvary where they're going to nail me to a cross. But fear not, they're going to lay me in a borrowed tomb. And guess what? On the third day, I'm going to speak the words and God's going to raise me from the dead. That's what you need to be focused on. Because life is not measured in how much you own, whether that's your possessions, that's your pride, or your prestige. It's not these things that God measures you by. Remember how God sent Samuel to Jesse's house to find a new king to replace Saul because he sacrificed rather than obeyed? Samuel looked at all the sons, looked at the first one and just knew he had to be it. God said, no, that's not it. He's not the one. 
you need to remember, I don't look at outward appearance. I see the heart. I know the heart. What God is interested in is what's in my heart and what's in your heart. Do we understand that? It's not in how powerful we are, not how rich we are. It's how rich we are toward God. Is there a brokenness about me because my neighbor doesn't know Jesus? Is there a brokenness about me because my co-worker doesn't know Jesus? Is there a brokenness about me because my enemy hates me and I can't bring myself to pray for him or her? Jesus said, stop looking at yourself. It's not about what you own. It's not about what's in your hands. Life is not measured by your best laid plans. This man had a great plan. It all came to fruition. Man, he filled his barns. And that night, that very night, after all that he had done, and after everyone had cheered him, that night, he died without any of it going with him. Do you hear the words of Jesus? That night, the Father, the Heavenly Father said, You fool. Tonight, your very life, your soul is required of you. Now, who will get all your barns? Do you notice how he's not mentioned his faith? He's not mentioned how he's honoring God with that. He's not, entered, uh, he's not mentioned anything about his family. He's not mentioned anything about his friends. Everything in this story that Jesus tells is about himself. And now he says, you fool, you lost everything because you were not rich toward God. And what does it mean to be rich toward God? It means that we begin to see with the eyes of Christ. We begin to hear with the ears of Christ. We begin to use the hands of Christ. We begin to walk on the feet of Christ. And wherever He leads, to love all that He loves, to minister to all that we can in Jesus' name, that's where life is. You know, can, can I, let me just say this and get in trouble one more time today. The greatest accomplishment that anyone who is a believer should have is that on the last day of their life, they've used up every penny they've had to honor the Lord in some way or another to advance His kingdom. You say, oh, Brother Chuck, I had to take care of my kids. You should have done that when they were growing up. Oh, but what about inheritance? Be reasonable. But listen. <laughs> I told my dad, you don't owe me anything. You prepared me for this. That was his investment. That should be our investment. And more. As we are rich toward God. So that my life is not an empty life. My life is a full life. Because I am walking and the path of righteousness for His name's sake, knowing full well that at some point in time I will stand before the Lord Jesus and I will give an account to Him for how I've lived. He may not judge. He may not be an arbitrator between who gets what in the family a state, but you can rest assured of this. He will judge all of us 
for the way we've lived, the way we've embraced him or failed to embrace him. And he will judge us, by the way, by the folks that we hang out with. You say, well, Brother Chuck, that sounds, a, that sounds a little harsh. I'm not quite sure where you're getting that. Well, here's where I get it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. You hang out with the wrong people, it will corrupt you, it will corrupt your faith, and it will corrupt your walk with the Lord. Just saying. Jesus said, it's those who are rich toward God that have a life that is full and abundant. Do you have a life that's rich toward God? Can I say to you this morning that He is patient and He is kind And his great desire is to bless you and to honor you in the way that you live. And he's still calling you, waiting on you so that he can bless you. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Go home and look it up this afternoon. Isaiah 30, verse 18. The Lord blesses those who wait upon him. Heavenly Father, continue to encourage and strengthen us as we continue on this highway called life. Lord, may we not run through your stop signs. May we not avoid your commands teaching us how to live and how to love and how to care for people the way you do. Lord, remind us this morning that we're not here to build big barns and fill them to the brim. We're here to build treasures and store treasures in heaven because we've been faithful to you. We've remained connected to the vine. We are the branches. You are producing the fruit. You are blessing us. And we are becoming a blessing to you as we faithfully love and keep your commands. Lord, lead us now as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and maybe you're here this morning and something that's been said, maybe in the power and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, God has been drawing you to himself and today you know that you need to come and to say yes to the Lord. You've waited long enough for him to bless you with restoration and reconciliation with him through faith and trust in the Lord Jesus would you come today would you trust him maybe today God has led you to a place where there are no questions no reservation about you being a part of this fellowship and uniting with this church as a follower of Christ joining the work that's ongoing here we invite you to come If we can pray for you, you come just now as we sing. Come to him. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom.
thankful for all of you being here this morning. Take a moment and fellowship with those that have shared this time with you. Our Bible study hour begins one minute ago, so you'll make your way uh, to Sunday school. Another long-winded preacher today, but thank you for being here, and God bless you as we share these moments together. Let us pray as we close. Heavenly Father, for your goodness, for your calling. We hope you found this week's message a blessing in your walk with Christ. We would like to extend a personal invitation for you to join us for worship this week at our Victory Baptist campus. To learn more about our scheduled worship times and activities at Victory Baptist, please visit us online at vbcmtj.org. That's vbcmtj.org. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we invite you to be here at the same time next week for the Voice of Victory.